Coming to DARPA is like grabbing the nose cone of a rocket and holding on for dear life. DARPA's a place where if you don't invent the internet, you only get a B. A DARPA program manager quite literally invents tomorrow. Coming to work every day and being humbled by that. DARPA is not one person or one place. It's a collection of people that are excited about moving technology forward. DARPA has a unique history of using competitions to solve interdisciplinary national security problems. My name is Stacey Wersba, and I'll be your DARPA host today. Recently, the agency partnered with the U.S. Geological Survey to launch a mini-competition, which was geared at crowdsourcing artificial intelligence tools and techniques to locate critical mineral resources within the U.S. The manager for the competition, Dr. Joshua Elliott, has experience in applying AI and machine learning to improve various aspects of science and expert knowledge and analysis. He has a hunch that those technologies could be used to automate key steps in critical mineral resource assessment workflows. Here's Dr. Elliott. About a year ago, I was brought into conversations we were having at DARPA around trying to figure out what approaches we could take to bring DARPA technology, DARPA programs, the DARPA performer base to bear on the problems of, in particular, our dependence on critical mineral imports. Critical minerals, as I think a lot of people know, are an essential part of supply chains. And in some sense, I kind of think of them as the foundation of so many high-tech supply chains, ranging from obviously electronics and batteries to things that are much more directly and obviously applicable to the DoD, such as guidance systems and you name it. Because I am a data and AI person, I said, how could I possibly improve this with uh, data and AI? One of my colleagues said, well, I've been talking to these people at the USGS who do the critical mineral assessments that form really the kind of underpinning the data basis for mineral exploration domestically. I wonder if there's not an opportunity for us to bring to bear some DARPA technologies and approaches to try and accelerate or improve their existing workflow, which could really have substantial downstream leveraged effects on domestic production by improving the very sort of data products and assessments that the industry uses to figure out where to explore. Critical mineral resource assessment is essentially an exercise in synthesis. It involves taking many different types of geologic maps, locations of known mineral deposits, geophysics, geochemistry and remote sensing, and integrating that data to make predictions about where future resources may be found. Here's Dr. Graham Letterer, research geologist at the U.S. Geological Survey. As a geologist, the folks at DARPA, Joshua included, reached out to me considering I work pretty much exclusively on critical mineral resource assessment. An assessment is really just trying to answer the question, where are resources located and how much might be there? So to do that, we start with what we know. So the process involves a bunch of experts, geologists, geochemists, geophysicists, sitting down, talking through the data together, working on things to basically fill in the gaps of our knowledge and all of that is very human driven and very manual. So thinking ahead about how we might accelerate this and do it more quickly in the future, we really need to convert what's historically been a manual process and somewhat of a tedious data compilation into something that can be done much more quickly and automated. So very quickly in this scoping effort, we realized geologic maps, something that's a, a foundational data set, is really a great opportunity. If we can teach a computer how to read a geologic map, we can do these mineral resource assessments much more quickly. There are many examples of DARPA competitions and challenges resulting in creative ways to solve problems. After conducting a six-month deep dive with the U.S. Geological Survey on their critical mineral resource assessment workflow, DARPA's Dr. Elliott decided to leverage that model, specifically looking at data extraction obstacles associated with the mineral assessments. In partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey, Dr. Elliott launched the AI for Critical Mineral Assessment Competition. The competition consisted of two specific sub-challenges, each lasting about eight weeks. Here are Drs. Elliott and Letterer again, starting with Dr. Letterer. We found that this challenge 
actually consisted of several different components. So the first thing we did was separate the geospatial component from the computer vision and feature extraction component. So the geospatial component, you know, given a map, can you figure out where on earth it belongs? As a human, you look at lots of key features. You might look at latitude and longitude marks if they're there, or if they're not there, maybe there's some other grid, or maybe there's just hills and topographic lines that tell you about the elevation and topography, or rivers, or maybe some place names. And all of that information is sort of instantaneously integrated by a human when they're looking at a map and trying to figure out where on earth it represents. But to teach a computer to do that, you have to explicitly define which features it should use and which it should ignore when trying to geo-reference that map to some pre-existing base layer. So that whole challenge is just where is it, right? Given an image of a map, can I put it in the right place? The second challenge is getting the content of that map. And this time, ignoring all those reference marks and topographic base contours and focusing on what is being portrayed in that map. And luckily for us, most geologic maps have a very extensive explanation or legend, basically a color key showing that this geologic unit is represented by this color and pattern on the map. And so we were able to exploit that using human annotators to label features in the explanation and then request that performers write automated solutions to read those labels and identify the features on the map. Performers were able to submit, each week they were able to submit their results for a blind validation data set. We then provided back their scores in the form of a leaderboard that they could track over the course of the challenge. And then during the last week of the challenge, we then released a completely blind evaluation data set. And the challengers had 24 hours to process it and return their answers for that data set that was then scored and the result published and the winners announced. I mean, it was an extremely hard problem that we were posing. And in a short amount of time, we managed to get back some really, really exciting solutions to that. Each challenge awarded cash prizes to the top three winning teams. For the Map Georeferencing Challenge, Canadian team Uncharted Software's simple, clean, and organized methods earned them top prize. And for the Map Feature Extraction Challenge, the winning team was a collaboration between the University of Southern California's Information Sciences Institute and the University of Minnesota. Let's hear from our winning teams, starting with David Yonker, CEO of Uncharted Software. When we first learned about the Critical Minerals Challenge, we were intrigued. We had been working for some time on developing environmental assessment technology using AI with remote sensing data. For instance, trying to predict locust infestations decimating crops in Ethiopia using machine learning models with satellite data. The jump from satellite maps to rendered maps did not seem like a big leap. Also, the critical minerals challenge is of broad importance spanning both the environment and the supply chain domain, which has also been a focus of ours for many years. And frankly, being in the business of creating elaborate maps from data, the opportunity to work in the other direction for the first time and create data from these beautiful old maps was just too good to pass up. When considering our approach to the georeferencing challenge, we could imagine a solution where landforms and geopolitical boundaries in the scan maps are matched to those in base maps. However, when you consider that maps can be of any scale and that many maps will only have partial shorelines and boundary lines or worse, none at all. And when you consider how much time it might take to train a model to accurately identify those lines, that's a very big problem to solve in such a short amount of time that may in the end only work for a small subset of the images. So instead, we focused on the one thing that all maps have in common, which is text. The state of the art in text recognition has advanced to the point where it has become ubiquitous. If you have the latest and greatest smartphone, you will probably have noticed that your mobile device is already using AI to identify and index text in the photos that you take with your camera. You can open a photo you took of a billboard, for instance, and tap on the phone number to dial it. We use these highly reliable text extraction models to find and classify labels in the maps, which would give us clues as to where the map was. Starting with the most reliable text being reference coordinates that we could identify, we use a cascading rule-based approach to combine other statistical and geolocation techniques in order to predict the mapping of image pixels to latitude and longitude. One of the incredible things about this challenge was how varied and complex the images were. 
Some maps were skewed, some were torn, some had stains on them, some had hand-drawn labels. They used different coordinate systems, or they had no coordinate references at all, other than place names. Many were old, but others were drawn in the early days of computers with garish color schemes and high pixelation. We enjoyed the immense challenge of tackling all of that real-world complexity, and we look forward to seeing where all of this work goes in the future, especially when analysts begin contributing their own expertise in combined human-machine workflows. And here's Dr. Yao Yi Chung from the University of Minnesota, representing the winning team for the Map Feature Extraction Challenge, which also included the University of Southern California Information Sciences Institute. As it turns out, he and his teammate and fellow research partner, Craig Knobloch, have been tackling this problem for years. Craig and I have been working on machine learning methods for extracting all kinds of information from scanned maps for almost 20 years. My PhD thesis is exactly on this topic. Plus, we all love maps. Our solution cleverly takes advantage of map design principles. For example, Weiwei's line extraction AI model understands that some map legends might repeat itself in the map for drawing a geographical feature, like dashed lines for pathways. This gives us significant advantages over traditional computer vision methods. Participating in the competition is a really valuable experience. It gives us access to lots of manual digitization data. These data are useful for training and validating our machine learning methods. The competition is also an exciting opportunity to have our students from two institutes working together toward a meaningful goal. We all learned a lot. With a fresh set of solutions in hand, doctors Elliot and Letter are excited about their potential to make workflows more efficient, more comprehensive, and more accurate, not just for critical mineral assessment, but beyond as well. These competitions have an amazing ability at really bringing together this diverse, energetic performer base that brings really creative solutions and energy to bear on a specific problem. And we were able to bring together these people really quickly and demonstrate the potential of applying AI and machine learning tools to address currently, you know, a relatively small part of their problem space, but really demonstrated the potential, I think, for a long-term solution that I think will really have a huge impact on our economic competitiveness and national security. I'm very excited about the proposed solutions that we've seen so far. I think this type of work has been applied to other fields, for example, in remote sensing and satellite imagery and also medical imaging. But to see it applied to geologic maps is just fantastic. And I think to build on that, there are potential applications in lots of different fields. You can think of like species range maps and biology or wildlife ecology and all sorts of information that's embedded in these map images and isn't easily accessible to, for example, researchers who need digital data. So I'm very excited about the prospects of using this as a tool in my research, but also making this tool available to other researchers in other fields. Overall, this has just been a fantastic experience working with folks from DARPA, JPL, MITRE, and the performers. I think it's a great model for interdisciplinary research. Having completed these challenges over the past six months in this pilot effort, we're in a much better position to take on the challenge of assessing critical minerals in the United States. Thank you for listening to this Voices from DARPA podcast. For more information about the AI for Critical Mineral Assessment competition, visit criticalminerals.darpa.mil. Thanks for joining us, and special thanks to Tom Shortridge for producing this episode and to Heather Dees for her assistance.